So, ultimate fantasy, what would it be? Two lesbians, probably. Sisters. I'm just watching. Funny? Yep. But obviously that fantasy isn't going to happen, nor does it make any sense. So let's crowbar that into being a metaphor for today's bad fitness question. So many health and fitness questions are based on wishes, fantasy, and only being asked in the hope that there is an answer that exists. We'll have a look at a couple of such questions today, one being more unrealistic than the other. I'll also cover a question from the point of view of a personal trainer, but it will hopefully cover a lot of bases, so it's still worth watching even if you're not a personal trainer. Okay, let's get started. You may begin to see a pattern in some of the questions I choose to focus on, and the use of the words what are or is the best is something that continues to rear its head in different forms, though this one is probably one of the most triggering Commonly what we are discussing here are fat burners. Not always, and I will broaden the outlook shortly, but when the question is asked in such simplistic terms, what is usually being sought is a shortcut. A shortcut that somehow bypasses the laws of physics. But with so much marketing and advertising implying that such products do exist, anyone desperate for a solution may bypass the logic and convince himself this is possible. Let's get this straight. Anything that claims to melt fat away is a lie. Anything that claims, with the solution you can eat as much as you like and continue to lose weight, is a lie. Anything that claims to shrink your fat cells or eradicate them altogether, is a lie. But, just for fun, let's go with it for a moment. Let's assume such miracle drugs do exist and they have this potent power to dissolve the fat off your body. What then? Do you keep taking the potent drug every day for the rest of your life? Well, no, once I've reached my goal weight, I'll stop. And then what? You haven't changed any of the fundamental elements that caused the weight gain in the first place. So if you stop taking the miracle drug, the same calorie excess and fat storing environment exists, possibly even more so now because you may have more complacency. After all, you have the wonder drug. So when you stop taking it, the fat storing restarts. Then I'll just start taking the drug again. What's completely lost here is any discussion of health. Commonly, a diet causing weight gain is going to consist of excess in something unhealthy, whether that be high sugar levels overwhelming your body's insulin production and pushing you towards issues like type 2 diabetes, artery clogging levels of unhealthy fats, excess of processed foods causing your body's defenses to kick in and deal with these foreign ingredients, and in focusing in these indulgent foods with what feels like little or no consequences, you're left with deficiencies in essential vitamins and minerals, resulting in a slowing or shutting down of vital functions, lower energy levels, poor focus, and a generally poor quality of life. The bottom line, there is more to you than your weight. A healthy, balanced approach addressing the root issues will always outperform any magic pill. Remember though, these magic pills don't exist. Yes, there are some fat burners on the market. Some do absolutely nothing, but there are some that do have an effect. I'm slightly reluctant to say the next part because I don't want to be part of someone's confirmation bias and taken out of context, but it is true that some fat burners cause an increase in metabolic output and often create a reduction in appetite. Though the level of change caused is slight and does not approach anything like the levels suggested in my earlier analogy, nor do they live up to the hype implied by their marketing promises. I'm not going to show any ads here because I don't want to give them the promotion, but the common one is a picture of a bottle or pack next to a picture of someone with a sculpted physique and six pack abs, as if that's what you'll look like taking these pills, despite the fact that it took the athletes years of training and healthy eating, yet the pills probably only went on the market a month after the photos were taken. But hey, you'll take what you can get, right? And some increase in metabolic output is better than nothing. Well, keep in mind, that's not all they do. The reason for the increase in metabolic output is often due to the inclusion of caffeine and often other stimulants, causing an increase in heart rate and oxygen flow within your body. You know, the thing that happens when you do exercise. Increasing your heart rate is a stressor. The difference being, when done through exercise, it's mostly done in a way you can effectively respond to. 
generating an improvement in your overall health and fitness. Taking pills just adds stress. With that can come increased levels of anxiety, decreased sleep quality, resulting in further stress, elevated levels of blood pressure, and given high levels of body fat are often linked with high blood pressure, this is only going to compound the issue, leading to, in some cases, death. Yes, death. So the question becomes, is an increased chance of death, no matter how small, worth a minor increase in fat burning? And I remind you, returning to our earlier analogy, by taking this route rather than addressing the underlying issue, any effects will not be permanent. But the question was on the best supplements for losing fat and didn't specifically ask about fat burners. There are other supplements that get touted as beneficial. So what about them? As a rule, the benefit of supplements is in the name. They're for supplementing an already healthy diet. And when used to shore up unavoidable shortfalls, they can be useful. Don't have access to wild caught or fresh fish? Perhaps your omega-3 levels are too low or out of balance with your omega-6 intake. So supplementing your omega-3 intake may prove valuable. When you're in a calorie deficit, as is required to lose weight, you're already limiting your opportunity for nutritional intake. So ensuring any deficiencies are dealt with will decrease the risk of illness and avoid putting your system in a position where it doesn't have the tools to function properly. And by creating a situation where there is a shortfall of fat intake is only going to cause your system to attempt to hang on to the stores it has. Whereas introducing good quality fats that are easily mobilized and utilized like omega-3s, CLAs, coconut oil, olive oil and the like, is more likely to encourage your body to release its stores. As ever though, this is about balance, not excess. And no one can say what you're deficient in or likely to be deficient in without reviewing your diet, running blood work or gathering large amounts of information from you. Therefore, any nutritional supplement could be the best solution for a specific individual, but that same supplement could be completely unnecessary and cause more damage than good for someone else. Some examples of this might be if you have a deficiency in zinc, supplementing could be important to boost your immune system and avoid you becoming ill, which would clearly hold you back. It also aids your metabolic function and help in the healing process, which is particularly beneficial if you get injured, but recovering from intense training sessions is also technically a healing process. Vitamin D is key in development of bones and muscles, and as our primary source of this is absorption through the skin from the sun, here in the UK, that's a luxury item for much of the year. But if you happen to work shifts, that means you're sleeping during the day, or you spend most of your day in a dark room and rarely get outdoors, supplementation could become crucially important. That said, if you can get yourself out into the daylight when you would not have in the past, that is more beneficial than taking pills. One of the common go-to options is protein powder. Drinking your protein can be handy. It's the macronutrient that is in short supply with many diets, mainly because when in a hurry, it's easier to grab a carby or a high fat snack than a protein filled one. It's also easier to overindulge in carbs and fats, whereas protein makes you feel full and has the bonus of burning more calories through the digestive process known as the thermic effect. On the flip side though, calories eaten have a higher thermic effect than those you drink. So there's nothing magic about protein shakes. And if you can eat the protein from healthy sources, that remains preferable to drinking it. So again, we're looking at whether a shortfall or imbalance requires redressing. The list could go on and on, looking at the effects of spices or the anti-inflammatory effects of things like curcumin, but each element requires more than lip service to do it justice. In the end, there is no magic supplement. What's required is a calorie deficit, but a healthy approach and balance is key. No matter how healthy or positive anything sounds, overdoing it will usually cause damage. Find your balance and you find your way. So by identifying imbalances that cannot be corrected easily, supplementation may be a useful tool, but there is no one answer as to which is the best, as that answer will be different for everyone. 
What hourly rate would you pay someone who's qualified to fix desktop Windows PCs to have a go at fixing your broken iPhone? Chances are you wouldn't. You might let them have a go if they seemed confident, but most likely you'd only agree to pay them if they fixed it, right? Okay, it's not the same because the phone is a fixed entity. You don't need it to participate in the process. The engineer is not guiding the phone to fix itself. Whereas with a personal trainer, they can't open you up, find the parts that don't work and repair or replace them. Though I'm sure it would be a much more in-demand service if that were the case. But the principle still holds. Just because someone has a qualification in a broad field doesn't make them an expert for the purposes that you require assistance with. My take on this is that you can either do the job or you can't. If you can't, you shouldn't be charging anything. Yes, you've got to start somewhere, but the PT may be getting more out of the experience than the client is in these situations. Now, this seems to have been a hot topic lately. If you spend any amount of time on LinkedIn, and feel free to connect if you do, you'll likely have seen several posts from service providers complaining when a potential client wants to pay them in experience or exposure. One of the recent posts I noticed was a chat thread between a musician and a potential client who wanted a musical composition for her wedding, but the client was bemused when she had to pay for the service. Now, on the one hand, if that musician had never done anything like that before, and it was an area she wanted to break into, then having something to showcase for marketing purposes does have value. And that value is worthy of consideration because the alternative might be to compose something for marketing only to show that you can do the job, which would then be done for free, but it has no backup of client testimonial or satisfaction. However, if, as in this case, the musician has a provable skill set and experience, now you're simply belittling that person's value. But as I've touched on before, a qualification as a personal trainer does not equate to experience or expertise. If, however, a PT has extremely limited expertise, yet is incredibly skilled in one area, and someone wants to hire them for that specific skill set, then the value is there, and it's right and proper to expect to be paid accordingly. But, returning to the initial analogy, if you cannot provably do the job, and there are other benefits to be had from the experience, then you should not be charging just because it's taking up your time. Your course took up time, and you likely paid for that, most likely this was done without much hesitation because it's the norm, but experience is part of education. The problem here has mostly arisen because the industry has begun to promote this shortcut approach as the norm. Courses are shorter and the promise of what will be achieved at the end are based on very skewed data. The industry average for a PT in the UK is currently between 50 and 60 pounds per hour, a model I'm not a fan of, but there are exclusive high-end trainers pulling this average up. One PT charging 200 pounds per hour is gonna have more of a pull in that average than a cheap PT charging 10 pounds. So there may be fewer on the expensive side, but it does sway the average. Yet that is what is being sold to potential students by the course providers as the norm. That kind of hourly rate is akin to an architect, an accountant, a lawyer, who is not only qualified, but has a few years experience under their belt, adding up in most cases to around a decade of learning and experience. Yet personal trainers are being sold the idea to expect this upon completion of a three month course, often with the additional note that they can start earning before the course is complete. An argument balancing the fact that they have no experience could be that they're not charging 60 pounds per hour. Maybe they're only charging 25. But let's return to my initial analogy, the broken iPhone. Would you be more willing to pay an iPhone specialist engineer 60 pounds per hour to do the repair they've done it many times before and can do it quickly and efficiently, or would you rather pay the PC specialist 25 pounds per hour to have a go at it, regardless of whether they succeed? But should a PT do the job for free? The difficulty here is that those who pay, pay attention. It's easy for people to lose focus if they have nothing invested. And if the client doesn't play their part, the personal trainer is no longer benefiting from the experience. As a personal example, for two years after qualifying as a PT, 
I trained clients for free. I refused to charge until I believed I was worth the investment I would ultimately look to charge to ensure I never had to overbook myself and cause my services to suffer. To combat those lack of focus issues, I did, for some people, put in specific conditions. The service was free, but they still had to invest something. For example, I might offer to train someone for three months for free, but they would have to give me a £500 deposit. At the end of the three months, providing they had stuck to their end fully, they got the £500 back. It's worth noting that many people that were offered that deal after telling me that I should train them for the experience and they guaranteed that they would be fully invested and appreciative turned this offer down. Suddenly they were not so certain of their commitment level. Meanwhile, I continued to work four days a week at a paying job as an architect, funnily enough. When I cut the cord and went full time, it meant I had experience, testimonials, and I knew I was offering value that exceeded my client's investment in my services. Within six months, despite being at the time the most expensive trainer in my gym, I was fully booked. Where others who started out charging around half my rates built their reputations as a cheap PT meaning that's how they were being referred to others, which left them stuck in that position. Training, nutritional correction, and lifestyle changes are extremely uncomfortable for most people, especially at first. The more an expert can help overcome that discomfort, navigate obstacles, and optimize progress, the more they are worth. But if you can't do the job, being cheap, in my view, is not an option. Just because you have a certificate, if you have little to no experience, you are still learning. Personal trainers who are working out how much they can make in the next month will often fail within a year or two. And based on the statistics over the past 10 years, that's around 80 to 90% of all PTs. Where those who focus on developing skills, experience and education for the benefit of others are likely aligning more with their reason for choosing that career path in the first place. And the value of those services is going to be much higher for everyone they work with. So how much should a personal trainer charge? Well, what's the value of the service? Both sides of the transaction should feel satisfied. The service being offered should feel of greater value to the client than the investment made. And the service provider should feel that their experience, knowledge and efforts are being suitably rewarded. So long as no one feels shortchanged, there is no wrong answer. What someone's service is worth to one person is not going to be the same for everyone. It's therefore the client's responsibility and in their interests to seek guidance from a suitably experienced expert. And it's the service provider's responsibility to turn down work that they have insufficient experience in, unless the transaction is then one of experience over money. As soon as one side of the transaction feels shortchanged, even if it is their own doing, that's where things go wrong. So, as with anything else in the realm of health and fitness, it's all about finding the right balance for each situation. The drive to save money, the drive to get paid, or the feeling of self-entitlement, even if it was promised to you by a convincing marketing campaign, is not benefiting anyone. As ridiculous as this question is, I understand where it comes from. For decades, so many gadgets have appeared showcasing technology that apparently works your muscles with little or no effort. A popular one that continues to resurface are the ab belts that put electronic pulses in your stomach, apparently stimulating them to grow. They do tend to disappear after a while because, simply put, they don't work. But as a new generation appears seeking a miracle answer to a flat toned stomach without all that ridiculous exercising or depravity of healthy eating, the marketing for newly branded versions will often make an appearance. So with massage guns being popular as a rehabilitation tool, and one that actually does have some merit for those purposes, it's not the greatest leap to believe that there may be a route to stimulating a response in the rectus abdominis to develop a six pack. But this does come under the category of wishful thinking and it's not worthy of any in-depth explanation. So the short answer to this question is no, no it won't. Remember, for every new subscriber on this channel, we're donating one litre of clean drinking water to those who do not currently have access. So if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to the channel. And now you're better versed on the use of supplements for fat loss, and you know using a massage gun is not going to lead to a six pack, but maybe another question that has crossed your mind is, how long should your workouts be? Or 
which diet is best for weight loss? If so, you need to watch this video next. And if you've ever wondered if you should focus on weight loss before lifting weights, I'll be covering that very soon. So even more reason to subscribe.